So we've been again focusing on the Apostles' Creed now for a number of weeks, so we're going to recite it again together. One week we recite it, one week we sing it. This is reciting week, so it'll be on the screen. Let's say this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into Hades. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, <laughs> the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Grace is going to read the scripture passage for us. It's the entire chapter of John 19. So it's on page 1683 in the Bible in front of you in the pew. John 19, verses 1 to 42. Jesus sentenced to be crucified. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who, is handed, who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known at the stone pavement. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with two others, one on each side of Jesus and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate. Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarments remaining. This garment was seamless, woven into one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide the, by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments amongst them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of his hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said to him, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. 
Because the Jews did not want the bodies to be left hanging on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it had give, has given his testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he no tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And, another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph and Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a dis disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they had laid Jesus there. Lord, thank you for your word. <laughs> Thank you that we can learn so much just from hearing a story read and a powerful story of, of the gift of yourself, of the Lord Jesus for us. I pray, Lord, that, um, that you would um, speak through your words to our hearts and to our spirits. Use these words, Lord, as weak as they are, to speak to us and to help us understand more just what it is you've done for us and how we are to respond. Lord, please give me the strength to do this and take this time it's yours. Do whatever you want with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Ruth was saying, saying she's tired. I, I, I tend to be a late night person, so I stayed up too late last night to begin with and then was awoken three times in my apartment from, by people screaming in my hallway <laughs> at like 3 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning. So, yeah, you're, you're being led by tired people today. <laughs> but the Lord is our strength. So that's the important thing. So the section of the Apostles' Creed we, want, Creed we want to look at today is, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. And we just read the account of that story. And I was, as I was looking at that, it struck me. I went, why did the people who put together the Apostles' Creed centuries ago, why did they include the name Pontius Pilate? There are lots of other names in the New Testament they could have included. There's nobody else mentioned in the Creed except for Mary and Jesus, of course. But why, why Pontius Pilate? I thought perhaps it was because they wanted to place the life of Jesus in the context of history. We talked a few weeks ago about the reality of who Jesus was, how he was a real historical person who lived on earth. And so maybe they wanted to do that because Pilate, Pontius Pilate, was a real historical person who lived on earth. Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea from 26 AD to 36 AD. Now, this was during the Roman occupation of Judea. The Roman Empire stretched throughout the known world at the time, throughout the Mediterranean, and they were the occupiers and the governors of the Jewish people in Judea. Now, Pontius Pilate was known to be a fairly fair gov governor uh, who let the Jewish people kind of do their own thing as long as everything went well. But he did not have a high view of the Jews. He was, one of the commentators said he was contemptuous towards them. He did not think them to be anywhere close to his equal. He did not govern according to their best interests, as we would expect a government to do, hopefully, but, but for his own career advancement in the Roman Empire. His main aim was just to keep everything calm. Just as long as law and order was happening, everything was calm, life was good. But if anything happened that upset the apple cart, historians say he could be cruel, he could be violent, he could be merciless. He would stop at nothing to, to crush any uprising, to crush any riots, to crush anything that the Jewish people might have done to, to try and fight back against the Roman oppressors, to upset the apple cart. So that may be why perhaps his name is placed in the Apostles' Creed, to place Jesus in the context of history. But perhaps it was also placed there as a hint as to who was responsible for killing Jesus. 
He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified under him, died and was buried. But was it Pilate alone who was responsible for Jesus' death, or was he part of something bigger? The question we want to ask this morning is, is who killed Jesus? And a lot of what we're looking at, I'm going to bring the book with me, is from a book called The Cross of Christ by John Stott. So rather than me saying a hundred times, John Stott said, John Stott said, just know that a lot of the outline and the information that we're going to share today came from that book. So who killed Jesus? Well, Judas. What about him? Didn't he have a part in it? Now, Judas was one of his disciples. He was a zealot. He was part of a political movement that looked for the Messiah, not only as a spiritual deliverer, but as a political deliverer, one who could free them from the, the bondage of the Roman oppressors, the Roman government. He was also the treasurer of the band of disciples. He was the one who controlled the purse strings for Jesus and for the 12 disciples as they traveled throughout Judea. And of course, as we know, most of us have heard that Judas was also the one who turned on Jesus, who betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Now, there might have been an element of political disillusionment, disillusionment there with Judas. Jesus wasn't who he expected to be. He expected Jesus, yeah, to do miracles and, and do that part of being the Messiah, but also he expected him to be a political figure, a political deliverer. But a lot of commentators think that the main reason why Judas did what he did was an element of greed. The gospel says that he occasionally would help himself to the communal money that he, he looked after. Money was really important to him. And being paid 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus was something that appealed to him. So Judas handed Jesus over to the Jewish high priests, the religious leaders. Judas had a hand in killing Jesus. Now, the Jewish leaders, the religious authorities at the time, were upset because with, they were upset with Jesus because of the subversive and provocative claims that he made. He said, for example, destroy the, pointing to the Jewish temple, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up, which of course he meant the temple of his own body. He said, I, am the fa I and the Father are one. He said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. And the Jewish leaders at the time would have seen these as blasphemous statements. How can you, a regular man, equate yourself to God? They were kind of blinded. They couldn't see all the miracles that he was doing and all the teaching that he was doing, that he really was the Messiah. They saw him as being blasphemous. They were incensed by his disrespectful attitude towards the law. He healed the man on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath day, the law said you were to do absolutely no work whatsoever. Yet a man came to him with a shriveled hand and needed healing, and Jesus healed him. And the, the Pharisees blew a gasket. They said, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, even if it did mean this man was healed and restored. He criticized the Pharisees for exalting tradition over Scripture, for caring more for regulations than for people. Jesus frustrated them because he was fraternizing with disrepute, disreputable people. He was feasting when he should have been fasting. He was called by a rabbi, a teacher by people, even though he had no credentials, never went to rabbi school, never you know, studied under other rabbis. He didn't go the approved route that the religious leaders said, you have to go if you're going to become a rabbi and a teacher. Jesus undermined the authority of the religious establishment. They wanted him out of the way. They wanted him killed. And the prime motivation, says John Stott, was envy. People were starting to follow Jesus instead of following them. And when they tried to trick him and ask him questions to try to, to tr paint him into a corner, Jesus was baffling them with his responses. They had no answer for him. There was an authority struggle, a power struggle going on, and the religious leaders were determined to win. They wanted him dead, but because they were under Roman authority, they had no authority to execute people in that occupied Roman province. Only the Roman leadership could do that. So the Jewish religious leaders handed Jesus over to Pontius Pilate. The Jewish relig religious leaders had a hand in killing Jesus. Now, Pilate, as we said before, was the Roman governor of the province of Judea. And after interviewing Jesus, he was convinced that the man was innocent, 
that he had done nothing worthy of the death penalty. And so he tried to avoid dealing with Jesus, dealing with the situation in one way or another. Remember, he just wanted things calm, law and order. He didn't want anything to upset the apple cart. Now, the religious leaders were trying to portray Jesus as a danger to Caesar, that he was subverting the nation. He said he, said he was opposing the payment of taxes, which if you know the story where that came from in the Gospels, that's totally a lie because Jesus told people, pay your taxes to Caesar. The religious leaders tried to stir up the people to go against Jesus. But Pilate said to them, hey, I've looked, we've in I've interviewed him, I've examined the, the evidence, there's no fault in him. In the process, he found out that Jesus was a Galilean, and he was like, oh, he's from Galilee. Not my job, Herod, he's the guy in charge of Galilee. So he just shuffled Jesus off to Herod and said, let him handle it, it's his jurisdiction. I just want calm and peace and law and order. Let Herod deal with it. Now, Herod was happy to see him because he had heard of all the miracles that Jesus had done, and he wanted to see one. He wanted a show. He wanted to see something. Come on, Jesus, prove yourself. Put on, do a miracle. Put on a show for me. And he asked Jesus many questions. And Jesus, knowing Herod's motivation, didn't answer any of them and didn't do anything. Just stood there. And Herod mocked Jesus and said, just go away. You're, you're, not, what, you're not what people say you are. Just... Go, go back to Pilate. I have no idea why Pilate sent you to me. And so Jesus was being like a hot potato. No one wanted to deal with Jesus. So the second time that, so Jesus comes back to Pilate, and for a second time, Pilate says, he's innocent. And so he told, he told the religious leaders, I find no fault in him, but you know what? Because you seem so adamant about this, I'll have him whipped, okay? No death penalty. He doesn't deserve it. We'll whip him the 39 times, and then we'll just send him on his way. And he didn't want to sentence Jesus because he knew he was innocent. But he didn't want to just release Jesus because he, then he would have the religious leaders on his back and angry at him. So he kind of chose this compromise that made no one happy. We'll whip him, punish him, and then release him. But the religious leaders worked up the crowd who yelled, crucify him, crucify him. They demanded Jesus' death. So Pilate tried a third time to release Jesus. And he said, according to the custom, this is Passover weekend, Passover celebration, and the custom as Romans is that we release one Jewish prisoner to you, someone that we've, we've taken. So he, he chose the worst possible guy you could think of, Barabbas. He had been part of an insurrection. He, was a, he led a riot. He had murdered people. He, he was a bit of a crazy man, just the worst possible person. And then he, he, cho he compared him to Jesus. He thought... If I give people the choice between crazy Barabbas and Jesus, of course they're going to choose Jesus. And of course, when he made the, gave the people the opportunity to choose, they shouted, Barabbas, Barabbas, give us Barabbas. Pilate tried to do the right thing, but he went about it the wrong way. Jesus wasn't being released because of justice, because he was deemed innocent, but rather Pilate was just trying to do a decent thing to release a guy who was innocent, not wanting to kill an innocent man. But finally, Pilate is frustrated and doesn't want this on his hand, on his head. Again, doesn't want to deal with it, doesn't want to upset the apple cart. So he calls for a bowl of water and he symbolically puts his hands in the water and says, I wash my hands of the whole thing. You do with Jesus whatever you want. Not my problem anymore. So Pilate, in wanting to satisfy the crowd, he weakly capitulated. He gave in. John Stott says, his conscience was drowned by the loud sea of voices of rationalization. He compromised because he was a coward. So Pilate handed Jesus over to the soldiers to be crucified. Pilate, in his fear and his cowardice, had a hand in killing Jesus. So the soldiers performed the physical act of nailing Jesus onto the cross. They were just doing their job. They were just following orders. One of the soldiers even afterwards expressed regret at what was happening. Now the cross was a horrible instrument of torture, probably the worst um, instrument of capital punishment ever devised by humans. People were nailed or sometimes tied, but nailed by their hands and feet to the cross, 
and the cross was then plopped down into a hole in the ground, jerking the person nailed on the cross. They were given a little peg on the cross that they could kind of sit on so that they wouldn't be torn totally from their hands with all the weight resting on their hands. They were in enormous pain and ex exposure to the elements. Um, it could last days. Sometimes a crucifixion could go on for days until the person finally died. There was no, a worse way to die. And the soldiers handed Jesus over to that, to the cross. The soldiers had a hand in killing Jesus. They all had a hand in killing Jesus. Judas handed him over to the priests and religious leaders out of greed. The priests handed him over to Pilate out of envy. Pilate handed him over to Herod out of avoidance. Handed Herod handed it back to Pilate out of disappointment. Pilate handed him over to the soldiers out of cowardice. And the soldiers crucified Jesus. Peter in his prayer in Acts 4.27 says, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you, had, whom you anointed. They all worked together to have Jesus killed. But ultimately, none of them killed Jesus. There is one person, there is one who is truly guilty of having killed Jesus on the cross. It's me. It's you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It was my sin that handed Jesus over to the cross, nailed him to the cross, and held him to the cross. Every wrong deed, every wrong thought, every wrong attitude I ever had, any wrong thought or deed or attitude that anyone had ever had that goes against what God has for our lives, that's what held Jesus to the cross. When we rebel, when we deliberately sin, it's like nailing Jesus to the cross all over again. We sacrifice Jesus to our greed, like Judas. We put Jesus and his purposes for our lives on the back burner while we pursue material wealth. We sacrifice Jesus to our envy, like the religious leaders. We want to be in charge. We want to run our own lives. And when Jesus arrives in our lives with all authority in heaven and earth, we rebel against that authority and we want to do things our own way. We sacrifice Jesus to avoidance, like Pilate. We would rather just not make a decision. I mean, we don't want to forget about Jesus and God. We don't want to abandon him, but we're not that sure we're ready to dive into a commitment to him with both feet. So we live in that mushy middle not fully experiencing the fullness of Jesus and not fully experiencing what the world has to offer either, pleasing neither ourselves nor God fully. And in the end, we end up nowhere, rejected by God and rejected by the world. We sacrifice Jesus to our disappointment, like Herod. We enter into the possibility of a relationship with Jesus with a, what am I going to get out of it, attitude. And when Jesus doesn't give us what we want, we dismiss him and move on to something else. We sacrifice Jesus to our cowardice, like Pilate, facing a spiritual decision in our lives, facing the decision of which path to take in life, God's or our own, we just decide not to decide. And we wash our hands of the whole thing. For following God and going against the flow of society and doing so takes courage. It takes a lot of courage but we would rather take the easy way out. And like all of those who had a hand in killing Jesus, so have I, because of my sin, had a hand in killing Jesus. My sins of commission, things I've done. My sins of omission, things I failed to do but should have done. My sins of my heart and mind, the thoughts and attitudes that run contrary to God's desire for my life. There's an old Negro spiritual song that asks, were you there when they crucified my Lord? The answer is yes, we were. And John Stott says we were not there as spectators, but as participants, guilty participants, plotting, scheming, betraying, bargaining, handing him over to be crucified. Stott writes, before we can begin, this is important, before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, which leads to faith and worship, 
We have to see it as something done by us, which leads to repentance and sorrow. Before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. And sometimes the cross doesn't move us like it should, and sometimes we don't fully understand the meaning of the cross because we don't fully realize and understand our part in killing Jesus. Peter Green, an Anglican canon, wrote, um, Only the man who is prepared to own his share or her share in the guilt of the cross may share, may claim to share in its grace. Only the man or woman who is prepared to own their share in the guilt of the cross may claim to share in its grace. Are you ready to admit your share of guilt for the cross? Are you ready to admit that you, that I, killed Jesus. If you are, then you're halfway there. For when we realize that it was our sin that held him there, and then we repent, which means turn to a 180 and turn away from the way we want to live to the way God wants to live, and we're sorry for our sins, then his grace and his mercy is poured out upon us and covers us, and our chains are gone, and our sin is taken care of. We killed Jesus. But yet, in a sense, no one killed Jesus. John 10, 17, 18 said, Jesus said, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. There's another old song, as the words go, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set himself free when he was on the cross. He could have called 10,000 angels, yet he died alone for you. And for me, Stott asks, who delivered Jesus up to die? Not Judas for money, not Pilate for fear, not the Jews for envy, but the Father delivered Jesus up to die for love. For love. Peter, in his sermon in Acts 2.23, he says, this man was... In his, actually, in his prayer, he prays, This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. It's both a work of God's grace and his plan, and it's a work of our own sinfulness. Stott writes, As we face the cross, then we can say to ourselves, Both I did it, my sins sent him there, and he did it, his love took him there. The cross is where human wickedness is exposed. That's why I've always thought it had to be so gruesome and so bloody. When the movie came out a number of years ago, The Passion of the Christ, it depicted the, the death of, the, of Jesus on the cross in a very bloody and gruesome way. And I've always thought, after I saw the movie, I thought, well, it had to be that way because our sin is gruesome. Our sin is ugly. Our sin is, leads to death. It's where our human wickedness is exposed, but also the cross is where God's plan of grace and mercy to overcome evil is demonstrated. John Stott concludes, ultimately what sent Christ to the cross was neither the greed of Judas, nor the envy of the priests, nor the vacillating cowardice of Pilate, but our own greed, envy, and cowardice, and other sins. And God's resolve in love and mercy to bear their judgment, and to put our sins away. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. As we look at the cross this morning, may we realize that we killed Jesus. Our sin put him there, and his love and his mercy kept him there so that he could pay the penalty for our sins and put them away for good, as far as the east is from the west, Scripture says. Our challenge this morning is to get a new vision of the cross, to gaze at it, stare at it, and realize our part in the death of Jesus, and then accept his grace, accept his mercy, accept the forgiveness that he freely gives, accept it as your own, and allow him this day to make you into a new creation. Would you pray with me, please? Maybe you're here this morning and you've 
Never, if you had bowed, has bowed eyes closed. Maybe you here this morning and you've never given the cross a whole lot of thought beyond it being on the top of a church or jewelry or it's where Jesus died. It's hard to think of it this way, but, but it's the place where we killed him. Our sin kept him there. The only reason for him to go was because of our sinfulness and his desire to have that taken care of to pay the penalty so that we could be forgiven. And I think, I honestly think that if you were the only person alive, if I was the only person alive, Jesus still would have done it, would have gone to the cross. But he did it for every human, every one of us. And so being reconciled to God and having a relationship restored with God involves Recognizing our own sinfulness, which is ugly and something we'd rather avoid, but admitting that, saying I'm sorry, and then allowing God's grace and mercy to just take over and wash you clean. And when he does that, it's hard to explain what it feels like, but you'll know. You'll know. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you'd like to do that, you could do that by praying a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I know that I've sinned. I know that I've done things that have hurt you, that have hurt other people, that have hurt myself. I know I haven't been living the way you want me to live. And it's my actions, my thoughts, my attitudes that have nailed you to the cross. And God, I'm sorry. Jesus, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please take over my life. I haven't done a great job of running it to this point. And I pray, Lord, that you would just take over and show me how you want me to live. Thank you for your mercy. Even though I don't fully understand it right now, I just look forward in the days to come of knowing that I'm forgiven and knowing your grace and knowing your mercy in my life. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can come and pray a prayer like that. And I thank you, Lord, that when whoever comes to you in, in repentance, you will not cast out and you accept us when we pray a prayer like that. So I thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that even though our sin killed you, killed you, Jesus, on the cross, um, you, that's, you went there to take care of our sin, to forgive us, to take on all of our sin and all the wrong things we've done. Continue, Lord, to give us the strength as we walk with you to examine our lives, to look at the things that maybe we're doing that or thinking or saying that, that hurt you, hurt others, and hurt ourselves. Give us the courage to look at it, even though it's ugly. Give us the courage to repent and ask forgiveness and remind us daily of the mercy and grace that you give us through the death of Jesus on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for your gift. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.